Hey guys, I'm Heidi with AMP Home Church and welcome back to our channel. We are on day eight of the Seeing the Unseen um, study here by Randy Alcorn. If you are new, welcome and thank you for joining us. These are all on a playlist, so be sure you go back and watch from the beginning. There's an introduction and then we do Monday through Friday every week with a new video as we go through studying, looking into this. This is an amazing resource by Randy Alcorn and Eternal Perspective Ministry as we are diving into this 90-day devotional setting our minds on eternity. So thank you for joining us. Today is day eight. It's probably gonna be a little bit longer because we got some really cool stuff to go through. So let's dive right in. Today's topic is the grace of giving. He says, Jesus Christ is the matchless giver. No matter how much we give, we can never outgive God. Amen. When God provides more money, we often think this is a blessing. Yes, but it would be just as scriptural to say this is a test. Abundance isn't God's provision for me to live in luxury. God entrusts me with his money not to build my kingdom on earth, but to build his kingdom in heaven. Let's really stop and look at these things. We always, throughout this whole study, want to be diving into this, holding that mirror up in front of us going, is this me? How does my heart factor in to these different topics? What am I doing? Lord, convict me, open my eyes, guide me, set my feet on your path, not mine. The act of giving is a vivid reminder that it's all about God, not about us. It's saying we are not the point. He is the point. He does not exist for us. We exist for him. God's money has a higher purpose than our affluence. Giving affirms Christ's lordship. It dethrones us and exalts him. Amen. And this isn't just for people who have, you know, six-figure incomes. This is for all of us, regardless of what our bank account might look like, right? Because we look down to the heart of the issue. That's the root cause. Are we clinging on and storing up our treasures here on earth? Or are we living and giving to store up our treasures in heaven? What are we doing? So yes, if you have what's in your bank account to keep your power bill on, that's what you need. But if the root cause is that you are hoarding and you are holding on to and you are not trusting in God, that's, a, that's the bigger issue we're trying to get to here. As we learn to give, we draw closer to God. But no matter how far we move along in the grace of giving, Jesus Christ remains the matchless giver. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Rich in this sense is not about finances, and this is not the health and wealth gospel. God gives to us in a thousand ways besides material prosperity. No matter how much we give, we can never outgive God. And again, the, the truly poor person out there is the one who thinks that wealth and abundance is only found in financial and material possessions. Is that what you hold on to and cling on to as a measure of your life and how it's going? That's not what we should be looking forward to. Excuse all the dogs going bananas. Okay, trying again. Um, the two scriptures that he has noted today in the perspectives from God's word would be 2 Corinthians 9 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Are we generous on every occasion? Notice it doesn't have like an asterisk, like only if just because, you know, yada, yada, there, there's no on every occasion because that's the heart. Generosity should pour from our hearts. If you have means to give, then give. If you have time to give, then give. If you have excess in your home to give, give. Whatever situation you're in, trust in the Lord and give. First Chronicles 29, 14 says, everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Everything is from God. Yes, if we get money, that is from God. If we have a home, that is from God. If we don't have a home, that's from God. If we have everything, every situation is from God, right? We talked about his sovereignty yesterday. I'm praying that you all went and watched the video that came with it because I thought it was just amazing, absolutely amazing. 
Okay, and then the two perspectives from God's people. The first one comes from R.G. Letourneau. I shovel out the money and God shovels it back, but God has a bigger shovel. C.S. Lewis said, there ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charity's expenditure excludes them. That's amazing. Okay, so I want us all to go. It's a long one. I'm going to try to go through it, but really go through this, stop, pause as you need to, and really dive in and think about these things, pray on these things, search the scriptures. But um, he has an article on his blog, 31 Radical Liberating Questions to Ask God About Your Giving. Um, and Randy Alcorn um, again, because this isn't about looking at a man, but if it's a man who's writing these things and discussing these things, let's look at him. Is he living the example? Is he living this out practically? For anyone looking at um, kind of that financial side of Christian living and biblical living, um, I highly recommend Randy Alcorn. He is insanely successful in the world's eyes when it comes to, you know, financial and stature and things of that nature. And this man walks the walk. His family walks the walk. They live in the same little house they've lived in before they were big and famous. He is, I mean, the millions upon millions that he gives away. Um, he is definitely someone that if we are looking for some kind of been there, done that type advice and help, um, He's a, he's a great resource for that. So we're going to go ahead and pull this up. It's epm.org forward slash 31 questions. So 31 questions. Um, and this is from December 18th of 2009. And um, it's an excerpt from his book, The Treasure Principle. And again, if you're looking for a resource along these lines, he's written many books that come to kind of that like financial, biblical living type topic. Um so let's go ahead and dive into this because again, I just, I think it's, it's worthwhile. It's worth our time. So it says asking specific questions of God is a great tradition in scripture at a pivotal point in his life. Second Samuel chapter two, verses one through two, David asked the Lord two very specific questions. Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked, and the Lord said, go up. David asked again, where shall I go to Hebron? The Lord answered. As God's children, we should ask and seek and knock, right? Go see Matthew 7, 7. His answers won't always be as direct as they were to David, but he invites us to ask him nonetheless. When it comes to financial stewardship, how God leads you will be different in many details That he th than how he leads me. Sorry, I got distracted by a notification. Um, so obviously, your life, my life, it, it's all going to look different. Not everybody looks the same. He hasn't handed each of us a standardized checklist with boxes to mark off. Rather, he has provided us with his word, with stewardship principles we must wrestle with. In the process of this struggle, God expects us to seek his face and to pursue counsel from godly believers. Financial stewardship decisions require wisdom beyond our own. Scriptures say, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. That's James 1.5. Do you truly desire God's wisdom and empowerment in making difficult stewardship decisions and evaluating your own heart? Then ask. Ask God. He won't leave you in the dark. He has given you his word and his spirit to guide you. The following 31 questions are designed to assist you. After each question, I've listed a key passage of scripture as well as other passages I'd encourage you to look up. You can ponder consecutively as many as you wish or meditate on one per day for a month. God promises that his word won't return to him without accomplishing the purpose for which he sent it. See Isaiah 55, 11. Isn't this just amazing, you guys? Like this gets me so giddy and excited to, to look at these things. Again, search these scriptures. Um, I, I highly recommend all of us, regardless of your financial standing, whether you have commas in your bank account or not, to pull this up, look at it. Let's meditate on these things and truly search our hearts on these. We're just going to kind of briefly go through them today. So in each of these brief meditations, focus first and foremost on all the scriptures, right? That's what I'm saying. I highly recommend Alcorn. Focus on God's word. That's where we seek our wisdom, our guidance. That's where we seek truth. That's where it's found in the scriptures. And secondarily, on the questions. So he's a man of God. He's sharing and prompting what the spirit tells him to, but he is not God's word. So always go to scriptures first. Okay? Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and give you direction 
and he will. We can count on it. So questions ask God. Question number one, Lord, in your word, you make a direct connection between experiencing grace and expressing grace through giving. So does the degree of my giving suggest that I have recognized and embraced your grace? That's question number one. Okay. See, and this is from 2 Corinthians 8, verses 7 and 9. See that you also excel in this grace of giving, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes has become poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You can also go to 2 Corinthians 9.15 and Romans 8.32. You guys got to pull up this blog post when we're done so you can write all these down. Question number two. Father, have you raised me up for such a time as this? Is it more than a coincidence that you have entrusted me with many financial resources in a time when the poor and unreached have such pressing needs and there are unprecedented opportunities to help them? Which is cool because I'm recording this on Purim and Purim is based off of the story of Esther. So it's cool that we bring this up again. But Esther 4.14 says, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. See also Acts 17.26 and Ephesians 2.10. And remember, guys, it doesn't matter if it is financial resources, time, abundance, just excess, whatever it is, right? We talk about it um, in, on my homemaker channel, talking about minimalism and simple living and giving our excess so it can go and be a blessing to someone else instead of us ourselves hoarding up these treasures here on earth. Question number three. Father, what am I guarding and keeping for myself that's preventing me from depending wholeheartedly on you? Which of my assets can I give to you so that you, not money and things, will be the center of my gravity? This is a huge question. Truly pour over this and look at your heart with this. What are you guarding and keeping for yourself that's preventing you from wholeheartedly depending on the Lord? We've been sharing for the past year or so our living by faith journey. Taking God up on his offer and saying, every day I'm relying on you for our daily bread. And what a journey that is. We're still on it. It's not done. I know I haven't spoken about it much lately, but um, it it's definitely teaches you a lot. It really, really does. Which of my assets can I give to God so that God, not money and things, will be the center of the center of my gravity? And then here are the scriptures. It has um, Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Christ said it plain and simple. You can't do it. If you think you're balancing both, well, I just got to do this, got to do this, got to have this. Oh yeah, but I love God. You can't. It's oil and water. They don't mix. See also Psalm 42, 1 through 2, and Matthew 5, 6. All right, point number four. Question number four. Lord, am I honoring you as owner of the assets you've entrusted to my care? I think that just in general. Are we living as trustees or as the owners? Because we don't own anything. We're just the trustees right now. And we hold everything with an open hand, right? If we have it today, that's cool. If it's gone tomorrow, cool too. That's fine. Do you really live that way? So am I honoring you as the owner of my assets you've entrusted to my care? Or am I treating you as a mere financial consultant to whom I pay a fee, 2% or 10%? Have I been acting as if I own the store and you work for me rather than recognizing you own it and I work for you? Leviticus 25, 23 says the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants. It's true. This isn't our home. We're just passing through. This is all God's. I mean, this is, we're citizens somewhere else. This is the Lord's. We're just kind of moving along until the time comes to be reunited. See also Deuteronomy 10, 14 and 1 Chronicles 29 verses 11 through 12. Question number five. 
you can see on my fingers. Sometimes I do that and I notice my hands down low and you can't see how many fingers I'm holding up. Where in my community do you want me to participate in meeting physical and spiritual needs through Christ-centered ministries? The inner city, prison ministry, pro-life work, is a short-term mission trip or long-term service overseas part of your exciting plan for me and my family? How are you serving? How does the Lord want you serving? Maybe in this season you're in right now, the Lord wants you serving right in your home, right in your home to your children and your husband, your spouse. Sorry, the guys are watching this too. I'm just thinking of me. So maybe it's right at home. Maybe it's to neighbors. Maybe it's to family. Maybe he wants you and your family uprooting and going to the Middle East to preach to, I don't know. I have no idea what the Lord wants for you, but are we seeking what he desires of us in this season of our life? Jeremiah 22, 16 says, Josiah defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me? See also Proverbs 28, 27, and Romans 10, 13 through 15. All right, question number six. Lord, why have you entrusted me with greater financial blessings than I once had? Is it to raise my standard of giving? Do I really see myself as your delivery person or do I assume you put things in my hands so I can keep them? Mm. That's a big one. That's, that's pretty good. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11 says, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Is that true of you in your life? See also 2 Corinthians 8.14 and Acts 11.29. These are some hard-hitting questions, guys. And seriously, I think we all should stop, make sure we go back and kind of work through these and really, really, really move through these. All right, question number seven. Lord Jesus, have I over-accumulated? If you are living in any Western society, the answer is probably yes. We love overaccumulation. Have I allowed unwise spending and accumulating debt to inhabit my giving to you? Have I said there's not enough left to give while maintaining spending habits that make sure there's not enough to give? Follow the money, guys. Pull up your bank account. Pull it up. Go through your transactions and see where your money goes. Sure, there, there can be things we enjoy, and, and none of us are perfect. I mean, even with little, sometimes we can make foolish decisions that we can look back and go, really, I needed to spend money on that. But really, before you say that you don't have a penny to give, are you sure you don't have a penny to give? Do you not have a penny to give, but yet you have, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and this and that, and, we, you know, you can go on and on and on. Do you truly have what you need or is your life full of excess? Are you spending money on stuff you don't need to? Are you being as wise and as frugal with what you need so that way you can be a generous giver? And even if you're already doing those things, we always all can do more. We need to be aware and paying attention to these things because you have to be diligent in these things. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be, will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. You can also go to Proverbs 22, 7 and 1 Corinthians 16, 2 for more on that topic. Question 8. Lord, I've sometimes wondered why you're not blessing me more financially. Could it be that I've been spending money on myself first rather than giving you the first fruits? Have I placed myself under your discipline? Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruins? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. 
Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth in its crops. That's Haggai 1, um, verses 4 through 6 and the 9 through 10. That was talking about the physical temple being rebuilt, but the same principle applies to us today. Do we grab the first of everything without turning and giving? I mean, look at, remember when Christ says, you know, why didn't you feed me when I was hungry and, and give me something to drink when I was thirsty? And they're like, what are you talking about? When do we never do that? And he goes, those around you, the, the least of those around you that is in need that you're not helping, that was me that you weren't helping. I want to see the giving and the generosity and the love. The greatest of these is love. So is it true love for the Lord when you make sure that you yourself have all your wants and desires and comforts when somebody right next to you is going without? Does this ever even cross our minds? See also Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 11 and Luke 6 38. Question 9. This is a somber one today, guys. And I'm probably taking forever. We're only at question 9. Okay, I will try to go for it. You know, instead of reading the scriptures, I will just tell them you guys can go look them up so that way I don't keep you guys for like 10 hours today. I'd much rather you go and dig into scripture than do this. Question 9. Lord, have I fallen for the lie that I don't have enough to give, despite the fact that the greatest examples of giving in scripture were poor people? Boom. That should hit all of us. Like, big ol' hammer. Go to Mark chapter 12, verses 43 and 44, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, and Galatians chapter 6, 9 through 10 for some starts on that. Question 10, Father, would it honor you if I determined a basic level of income sufficient to live on, then simply gave away whatever you provide beyond that? In the process, would you teach me to be more grateful and content? Um, let's go into Ecclesiastes 5.10, Hosea 13.6, and Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 on that. Question 11, Lord Jesus, since financial assets will burn at your second coming, will the assets I've stored up on earth be wasted if you return in my lifetime? Guys, I don't know how much longer we have before Christ returns. And before that, the rapture of the church. We're looking at the news. We're looking around at the world stage right now and everything is getting ready to go. So if that trumpet blast goes tonight, is what you're storing up in your home, in your bank account, in your whatever, is it really worth it? Is that really what you want to be focused on? Besides the fact, I mean, you could get hit by a car tomorrow. I mean, we could, people, you know, have heart attacks. They just don't wake up. I mean, anything can happen. Our day's set. We don't know when it is. Is this really what we want to be doing? Are we really focused on the right things? If Christ showed up tonight at your dinner table and pulled up your bank account transactions from the past 30 days and asked you to explain each one, could you do it with confidence? I don't know. Sometimes I don't like explaining things to my spouse. <laughs> what am I going to do when I have to explain that to the Lord? Really? Things to think about. Pull up 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Ecclesiastes 5.15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 25. Question 12. Lord, does the fact that you entrusted your money to me indicate you want me during my lifetime to invest it in eternity rather than passing along that responsibility to my children? Once my children have finished college or are working on their own, would inheriting my wealth beyond items of sentimental or heritage value be a complicating or even corrupting influence. That's interesting. Sometimes we think about, well, we have to do these things for the inheritance to leave to our children. But is that really the best thing to be doing with this? Could it possibly be complicating or even corrupting their influence? Is that really the best, the best stewardship? Proverbs 20, 21 says, an inheritance quickly gained at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Um, we can also see Proverbs 13, 11 and 17, 26, and then 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Question 13, how can I be sure that the assets you've entrusted to me will serve you after I die? It's a good question. 
How can I know that those to whom I leave these resources will use them to advance your kingdom? If my children are adults and independent, should I just give away now what I can and when I die, leave most of what remains to my church and missions or ministries that are close to your heart? Um, you can go to Matthew 25, 34 through 35, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, and Colossians 3, 23 through 24 for more on that. Question 14. Father, what's the eternal downside in giving as much as I can give to you now? Ooh, what's the eternal downside in giving as much as I can right now? In contrast, what's the eternal downside of minimizing or delaying my giving? What's that difference? It's easy, right? Where, oh, I can't give away this because I have to do this. Or what if the car needs a repair? What if this? What if that? What if that? Right? Any, anything that isn't trusting God, right? We like to go through. What's the consequence of not? Luke 16, 10 through 12. Luke 19, 17. Mark 10, 29 through 30. And 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. All are more on that. Question 15, Lord, if I delay giving now, is it possible the money may disappear or I may die before I get a chance to give it? Psalm 39, 4 through 6, Ecclesiastes 5, 13 through 14, and Ecclesiastes 8, 8 for more on that. Question 16, if I don't release my resources now for your kingdom causes, will I be in danger of becoming more wrapped up in earthly rather than heavenly treasure? Dang. Mm. First Timothy 6, 17 through 18, Matthew 6, 21, and Hebrews 3, 15 for more on that. And let me just read that first Timothy. It's um, chapter 6, verses 17 through 18. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. We're holding up the mirror. Every single one of these questions, guys. Question 17. Lord, will I rob myself of joy and reward and rob you of my trust? By holding on to significant assets, I could have joyfully given to you. Philippians 4.17, Hebrews 9.27, and Ephesians 6.8. I hope the rest of you are feeling like a just pit of <laughs> conviction as we're reading through these. Because guys, we all, we all have to continually reassess ourselves on all these matters. Question 18, Father, Wall Street can't touch the eternal returns of investing in your kingdom. So why are my eyes so often focused on temporary earthly investments with such pitifully small return? Lord, please broaden my perspective, increase my faith, and expand my eternal investment mentality. Amen. Matthew 19, 29, Hebrews 6, 10, and 2 Corinthians 4, 18 for more on that. Question 19, Lord, please help me to see clearly where best to give your money. How can I determine which recipients will most benefit from the money I give and which will likely mismanage it? Help me be not only a generous giver, but a wise one. Trust in him. It doesn't always look what we think it looks like. So let's trust in him and let him direct our giving. Philippians chap, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 5, and Proverbs 14, 7 on that. Question 20, you, commanded Zacchaeus for give, you commended Zacchaeus for giving away half of all he had, seeing it came from a transformed heart. We are Jesus followers just like those people 2,000 years ago. You've never changed your opinions about giving generously, have you? God, would you empower me to trust you enough to act in obedience to you for the good of the needy? Amen. Luke 19, 8 through 9 talks and tells the story there of Zacchaeus, but we can also see Matthew 19, 21 and Luke 14, 33. Question 21, if I were to make a list of all the assets you've entrusted to me, Lord, and ask what you want me to give away, is there anything, house, car, real estate, retirement funds, bank account, anything, that I'm treating as untouchable. If you ask the Lord right now, hey, what do you want me to give away? And he said, your house, your 401k, your investment real estate, your vehicle, excess clothes in the closet, whatever it is. Is there anything that you are holding on to as untouchable? Anything? 
Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all his. None of this is yours. Your 401k isn't yours. Your house isn't yours. Your car isn't yours. Your clothes aren't yours. It's not yours. Are we treating it like it's ours? See also Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Psalm 50, 12, and Haggai 2, 8. Question 22, Father, without realizing it, am I making money my God substitute? Am I failing to experience the pleasures that can be found only in you? Psalm 63, 1, Colossians 3, 4 through 6, and Psalm 34, 8. Question 23, when I meet you face to face, will I wish I had given away more? God help me by your grace to close the gap between what I'm giving now and what I'll one day wish I had given. Luke 12, 15 says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, all kinds. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We're also not defined by our lack of. Just because you're lacking doesn't mean something negative like the worldly outlook would tell you it does. See also 2 Corinthians 8, 7 and Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Question 24. Lord, I know you call me to be wise, but am I focused on saving to the point of hoarding and stockpiling like the rich fool instead of trusting you? The rich are most always the fool, guys. If you look throughout scripture from Old Testament to New, because it's so easy to buy into this worldly system and hoard onto these things, don't be the fool. Matthew 6, verse 34, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, and Philippians 4, verses 6 and 19. I'll touch on that. Question 25, Father, are material assets competing with you for lordship over my life? Have I been giving enough to experience a joyful liberty from the tyranny of money and things? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 through 11, you guys. Go read it. Pause, go read, come back, whatever. See also Ezekiel 28 verses 4 through 5 and Revelation 3 verses 17 through 18. Question 26, what specifically am I hanging on to that you want me to be giving away? What is it? Even if you think, oh, I don't have very much, none of this can be talking about me. It's talking to all of us. Regardless, like I said, of the number in your bank account or the fact if you own a bank account. What are you hanging on to? God say and let go of. Since you promise me it's more blessed to give than to receive, what happiness awaits me by letting go and becoming more of a giver? Proverbs 22, 9, Acts 20, verse 35, and 2 Corinthians 8, 13 through 15 for more on that. Question 27. Jesus, how can I better communicate with and pray with my spouse and children so we can walk together down this exhilarating road of giving? If you have a spouse, if you have children, this needs to be a family discussion. This needs to be something that everybody is educated on, understanding of, and on the same page of. Let's talk about it. This is a, a way of living, not just some little thing you get on and like a bill you pay. Oh, well, I dropped off my 10% to church. I'm good. No, it's so much more. And are you modeling this for your children and training them up in these ways? Because these are the Lord's ways. This is our responsibility as parents. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 through 19. Um, also 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 25 for more on that. Question 28. What am I doing and what should I be doing to train the children in my sphere of influence to be regular, joyful, and generous givers. Your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, neighbor kids, friends, whatever, whatever you have in front of us. How are you living this out? How are you sharing this? How are you modeling this? How are you training them up? Proverbs 22, 6, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and 1 Corinthians 16, 2 for more on this. Question 29. Lord, I realize that in most places around the world, I would be regarded as extremely wealthy, even if I'm lower or middle class in this place and time. If you are on a device with internet watching this, 
then you are in that percentage that if we were to take every human being on the entire globe and categorize everyone out, those of us with a device and an internet connection hanging out watching this right now, I guarantee you, would be regarded as extremely wealthy. And I know sometimes that's hard for us because we are struggling. We, I mean, you guys, I might have $6 in my bank account right now, okay? <laughs> I've got nothing fancy to be holding on to. Um, I used the last of my cash to pay some bills yesterday, and we're just kind of making do with what we got and know that the Lord will provide our daily bread each day, and it is what it is, and it's fine. I trust him for that. He will move and do whatever he needs to. I am still considered extremely wealthy in this in this diagram or whatever we would put together if we took every person in the world alive right now. So I realized that in most places around the world, I would be regarded as extremely wealthy. Have you put so much into my hands because you have blessed me with the gift of giving? What have I been missing out on by not exercising this gift to a greater degree? Are we all exercising our gift to a greater degree every day more and more and more? Look at Romans 12, 5 through 8, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and Galatians 6, 9. Guys, I'm telling you, we, I like his idea of taking one of these questions each day for a month because we got some soul searching to do. And then we got some practical application to be applying. Question 30, if I am a giver, whom have I been teaching and mentoring and giving? Is that something we even see hardly anymore? Being mentored and giving. In a spirit of humility, how can I share with others the joy of giving? Notice he said first, in a spirit of humility, how can I share with others the joy of giving? Look at 2 Corinthians 9, verses 2 through 3, 1 Chronicles 29, 1 through 14, and Hebrews 10, 24. Last question. Question 31. Father, please empower me to live each day here like I will wish I'd live five minutes after I die. Let me read that again. Empower me to live each day here. Every day we have right? Each day we have here right now, let's live it. Like I will wish I'd live five minutes after I die. So think about when you're laying on your deathbed, the things you're going to be like, dang it, I wish I would have. I wish I would have given. I wish I wouldn't have stored up all the things. I wish I would have been more patient. I wish I would have just spent the time with my kids. I wish I would have loved and served all of the things. Lord, empower me, convict me to apply those things to today, right now, every day. Help me look forward to heaven and the new earth and to storing up treasures there. You guys, that's where it will last for eternity. You could give me $5,000 today. And by the end of the day, when I'm done paying bills and buying the things that need to be bought and, and <laughs> trying to fix my stinking car and all of the other things, guess what I'd have? I'd have like nothing <laughs> because it would all be gone, right? You, you win the lottery, you pay off your debt, you fix your house, you do all the things you need to do. And next thing you know, it's all gone, right? What about heaven and the new earth? Those treasures that we will receive there are eternal, eternal now, remember, we're living for the line right here. We're at the dot, but we're living for that line that goes out to eternity. Not the bank account that's going to be empty in 10 minutes. I long to hear from you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew, 20, Matthew 25 verse 21. What steps can I take to make this happen? We can also look at Matthew 16, verse 27, Proverbs 19, verse 17, and Matthew 10, 42. And again, any other, if you're looking for more resources on money and giving and things like that, I'm telling you, I highly, highly recommend Randy Alcorn. Um, amazing man of God for those resources. And you guys, those are 31 questions out of his, just one of his books on where we're storing up our treasure. And I know I'm feeling it. And I hope you guys are too. Because I know, 
I'm already planning to go back and take him up on that every day for a month, really weighing these things on my heart and applying these things and looking through them and holding that mirror up to myself on this. So I know this was a long one today. I'm sorry, you guys, but um, I think it was definitely well worth it. Seeing the unseen, I'm telling you, I'm loving this every day. I'm like, it's so much better. And I know I keep saying that, but it is. So that was day eight with the grace of giving. Be back here for day nine. Make sure you subscribe, tap the little bell icon if you haven't already so that you get the notifications. I've been trying to post them on our Facebook home church group as well, um, but I have forgotten a few days, so I'm sorry. But come join us on Facebook at the home, um, our home church group. Everything's linked down in the description box. And I go spend some time in prayer. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, guys.